You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Ask Drone You news show. Joining me today, as always, is the Flying Dutchman. Haya, how are you doing? Very good this morning. Paul, how are you today? Doing good, doing good. I had a little bit of a breakdown earlier this week as the battlefield fatigue of the pandemic has, I feel like, finally hit me. Because it's, yep. as everyone knows, if even if you're at home, this battlefield fatigue, right? This is the same thing as like in war. Once you're there for a certain amount of time, the rate in which that you get tired exacerbates over time. And uh, I think I'm feeling it. I think a lot of other people are feeling it and it's okay. You know, I think we got to give some people some grace. So I, I honestly... It's hard, but it's good, Haya. I saw an image uh, yesterday from uh, Governor Cuomo here in New York, and he was saying, oh, we've been in this situation for 53 days now, and it feels bad, like it's it's been forever, it feels like. Then he showed First World War, Second World War, uh, Spanish flu, uh, Great Depression, all that stuff. And like, all that stuff went on for years. Like, this is nothing still. So hopefully it won't be much longer because it, it is pretty bad, but it's uh, been through worse, apparently. Yeah, definitely. But that brings us to our first uh, piece of drone news, Haya. As people are stuck at home, they are trying to find ways to get out. They're trying to find ways to explore the world and just literally get some exercise. So I recommend for anyone out there, even if there are no parks open or whatnot, don't be afraid to explore the urban jungle and take off. That way you can hashtag fly from home. But Haya, as more and more people explore the skies around where they live and better understand their neighborhood or the world they live in, it seems like certain things are easier to discover right now, which is kind of cool. And one drone pilot out of Michigan is showing us why we should get out and fly from home. What's going on? Yeah. This is a really cool story. I mean, uh, this is about the Great Lakes and specifically about Lake Michigan. After the winter, all the algae in the lakes have died off. And so early spring is when the water is crystal, crystal clear. And as many of you know, um, over the Hudson River and the Erie Canal towards uh, through the Great Lakes, that used to be a main, main shipping throughway back in the day. And because of the sudden storms in the Great Lakes, there are over 6,000 shipwrecks. And a lot of them are actually near the shorelines where the water is not that deep. So I'm talking maybe 10, 20, 30 feet deep. Early spring, when this water is so crystal clear and you look from the top down, preferably with the drone, of course, you can see right through that water. And this photographer um, totally capitalized on that by uh, stitching, I think it's 80 images together to get super crisp and detailed photos of the shipwrecks that you can see at the bottom and it's uh, i mean unfortunately it's a little far from where i am uh, to drive out there but if i was in the uh, lake michigan area i would totally take my drone and get some of these shots it's it's a stunning view it is a stunning view and frankly you may not know what is around you in fact this brings me to a good point that i think is important for people three or four years ago i got hired by the discovery channel to shoot a show that's on the science channel um i forget what it's called it's like uh, our weird world or or something like that. And they were showcasing how there are like drawings of people, there were like Nazi symbols, and all of these targets that were drawn into the desert and that you can only see it like 400 feet up, kind of like what you see in Peru, right? And yeah. I never even knew that existed here. So for everyone out there, if you are feeling bored, you're just feeling down, you need some sort of refresher, just don't be afraid to say what's hidden in the city near me because you never know what you can go discover. And don't forget, drone pilots, you are essential if you are media. Hope you have those media passes that we talked about all these years. So, <laughs> but Haya, I know it's not all, um, you know, rainbows and unicorns for everyone out there in the wake of the virus, which has really upticked kind of the questions surrounding how we use our drones. In the wake of the coronavirus, it seems like many of our constitutional rights are kind of under threat 
or new solutions that force people to think about what rights they truly have. Well, those are coming at us almost every day watching the national news. But as the Flying Dutchman is about to show us, it looks like in some states, these very drones that we're afraid of, that are breaking privacy, mass surveillance, enforcing social distancing, do know there are federal protections for you, but some states are, mm, how do I say this, hunkering down to make sure that drones are only used for good. And this next story, which takes us down to Palm Beach, Florida, has one particular drone operator probably pretty happy in regards to what's going on and his legal rights. Haya, what's going on in Florida, which seems to be uh, quite the hot spot of news this week? Yeah, uh, Palm Beach, Florida, ritzy town right on the coastline, the east coast of Florida, a lot of expensive houses there. Police drone had taken a picture of a Pelican mid-air, uh, pretty close to the uh, unmanned aircraft, actually. It's a pretty amazing uh, shot. It was published in local news, and people then started having this discussion online, saying, hey, but are drone photos that are taken by the police, are they even admissible as evidence in court in case there would be a, a court case? And it turns out that there is a, a statute in Florida, number 934.50, and it basically explains that you can't use drone footage in courts because drones would have to fly in the um, safe and admissible public airspace over 500 feet, according to the FAA. Whereas, of course, we also know that the drone rules prevent drones from being flown higher than 400 feet. So it creates this weird situation where if you want to use aerial footage in court as evidence in Florida, you'd have to take it with a helicopter or, let's say, uh, an airplane from above 500 feet to get the shots. And therefore, you can't use a drone because you wouldn't be allowed to fly over 400 feet uh, as per the guidelines and rules from the FEA for drone pilots. So there's this whole discussion been ongoing. The local police said that they were not using drones to collect evidence. They were merely uh, using drones to, to basically monitor and see if people would gather in larger groups on the beach. And if so, they would send out uh, police on foot or by car, whatever, to go out to these people and to explain basically the rules of social distancing. So the police was very uh, adamant about the fact that they were not using drones to collect evidence. One thing, of course, that we have seen during this entire virus outbreak is that a lot of police forces around the country, but also globally, have been using drones to notify people, to announce the public orders for people to stay at home. And in countries such as China, they've gone even further. They've used drones to spray public areas with disinfectants and even try to measure uh, body temperature with the thermal cameras from drones. So we've seen an uptick in, in how government agencies are using drones since the outbreak like we've never seen before. And this really scares me, too, because it seems like many public safety drone departments are constantly learning the rules as there is no standard. And this yep. bifurcation could cause harm to the entire drone industry as, you know, cops are saying, well, we're using the drones for good. That doesn't matter. What matters is the public's perception and the public and myself included. We're not happy because this is like fundamentally and constitutionally not OK. So frankly, I know in Florida, I love to see that Florida has these protections in place. If you guys are familiar with the law that Haya is talking about as far as aircraft operating at safe altitudes. Remember, we've talked about safe altitude operations before in the wake of helicopters flying at altitudes that drone pilots think that they should not be flying. But if you remember, it's, uh, I believe, 14 CFR 119 Section C, I think is what it is, for the uh, safe operating altitudes of aircraft. And I think that that's where that law probably uh, gets that 500-foot figure from. And I have to say here, Haya, I know in the most recent reauthorization act, Congress tasked the FAA with coming up with privacy protections, um, you know, for drones. But have we not forgotten about existing privacy protections uh, that have come down from, you know, SCOTUS? And does this raise a question of maybe a rather new time that we should be enacting digital rights, meaning, you know, privacy rights, not only from the skies, but privacy rights from these little buggers in our pockets. This is a bigger this is a bigger issue than a drone. And uh, it, it really, you know, makes me. Um, how do I say this? Haya? troubled. I am troubled because drones can be used for good. 
if people start becoming fearful of drones again, it's going to hurt everyone. I mean, I think police officers, I know their intentions are good, but at the same time, we need to really think with our PR hats on right now. And we need to think about the public at large. And, you know, let me give give me one second, Haya, because this whole social distancing for you police officers out there, it's time to put on your thinking caps, right? There was a university who published a study about how far your cough and how far your sneezes actually go. And then they showcase how that works when you're inside of a grocery store. And if someone coughs, you're talking 20 plus feet of transmission distance. So a six foot social distancing is useless. Not only that, let's put our thinking caps on one more time here, ladies and gentlemen. What do we know about this virus? We know that there is 10 days of asymptomatic transportation. What does that mean? Your thermal camera is useless and you are only hurting everyone else by trying to use drones to do good. It may, you may have good intentions, okay? But if you're not being perceived like that, well then, my friends, it doesn't matter. This is why I think a lot of public safety agencies need to read the book, Words That Work. Haya, what, what do you have? Well, I was going to add to that. That's uh, maybe one, for the drone industry, one good thing that kind of comes out of it uh, is that with all these stories appearing in the media about how police and other agencies are using drones during this pandemic, it kind of puts you to the forefront and puts a spotlight on it. And it creates all these discussions and conversations that we should be having about the rules and regulations that need to be applied. And I think without the crisis, that would not have been so obvious. Now there are so many examples and so many people are exposed to, hey, Police are using drones to monitor us, to instruct us. What are the rules and and how can these drones be used? And I think that's a public discussion we need to have. And we need to make rules that that work for everybody in the society when it comes to this. Yes, yes, we do. We also need that standardization of drones in public safety. I mean, you know, we've been working with a couple of groups uh, from L.A. to New York about doing this. And those people, I think, the people who take the time to go down the rabbit hole on all of this, like John, you know, John Wakey from FDNY, we did that podcast talking about like, okay, we cannot ignore this anymore, people. You need to know really, really clearly operating under a COA versus 107. For example, Haya, this is why right now, right? All of these public safety agencies that are doing this social distancing and forcing, like, for example, the story that came out of Connecticut this morning and Dragonfly and all of that, if that police agency is under a federal COA, you bet your butt, Haya, I am personally going to file FOIA requests on every single public safety agency that's operating under a COA so I can send those to the ACLU and say, stop this gross breach of privacy, please. And here is every single example of it happening, right? This is, this is a point, right? A lot of cops are probably going to hear this and be like, Paul, don't do that, that you're going to put us in a horrible position. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But these are things that you need to think about operating under as a public safety agency, right? Because it's not just me who can pull your flight data, right? It's some egregious asshat who wants to sue you in civil court who can pull it too. So we have to start thinking about these things. And I'm, thank you so much for bringing up that point, Haya, that like, yeah, these are hard conversations, but you know what? It's time to nut up and it's time to have them. It's time to have these conflicting conversations because it's the only way we grow. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's that's the issue with drones is that the technology is advancing so fast. Drones become smaller, more capable. They become less expensive. So they they, they spread like a virus as well. Right. I mean, more and more people get their, their hands on these aircraft. And so do police and other uh, government agencies. So, yeah, it's about time that we have this conversation and lay down the groundwork and the rules, uh, how they can be used and how they cannot be used. Yeah, I could not agree more, which brings us into our next story which it looks like, Haya, you know, from last week's news show, and I kind of had snuck in there. I was like, well, Anolfi, you know, may have one more drone that a lot of people are not aware of, and it looks like you went down the rabbit hole to find it online. Well done. Well done, Haya. Well, what did you find that Parrot doesn't want everyone to know, and for good reason, because countries like ours, uh, we would freak out if we heard about this, so... For the people that might not remember, this is the uh, Parrot Anafi. It's a small, lightweight drone. It's it's very lightweight. It's almost flimsy. It uh, makes me think of the uh, DJI Mavic Mini, basically. It's, it's that light and small almost. It's quite a capable drone, especially when you come up with a different version that has a 33 times zoom lens 
as well as some thermal lenses. This is a drone that's uh, specifically for uh, military use. It's not available to the public. If you Google it or search it, you won't even find images or any information on it. I was just able to uh, to get lucky because somebody passed along some brochures to me with uh, with some information about this drone. But just think about it. I mean, the Paradanava, you can easily throw it in your backpack. You can easily take it with you anywhere. It, it may not be as capable as some of the other drones we know, but it, for sure it's good enough to fly in a, in a reasonably sized area and scope out uh, the terrain and, and see who's hiding or who might be missing. The drone is marketed to military use, and it says that with the zoom lens, of course, you're able to zoom in tremendously. It's, uh, it's crazy the amount of zoom that you get when it's a 33 times optical zoom. However, it can also spot human beings. So during daytime, you can see up to a thousand meters, which is, let's say, what, mere more than half a mile and identify people. At night, it's a little close. It's about 200 meters. And when I was reading these specs, I'm thinking, well, this is not just for military use. I mean, if you think of search and rescue and first responders, I'm sure they will be dying to get their hands on the drone like this as well, right? I mean, the zoom lens allows you to, to fly around and scope out a large area. The thermal cameras are allowing you to find people who might be lost. Uh, we've seen plenty of people that were lost in woods or during hiking trips that were saved and found with the help of drones. A lot of times people use the uh, DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise, which is a great drone for this purpose. If you want a higher resolution, a lot of times they use a DJI Matrice 200 and 210 series. However, that drone is significantly bigger and more expensive. So a small drone like the Anafi is something you can easily throw in the backpack and take with you. And I think if this drone would be available uh, within the search and rescue community, a, a lot of people probably would get excited about it. Yeah, I think this is the drone that a lot of people are replacing their 210s with because uh, based off of some information I found online, it seems to be about the same price point as a stripped down 210 without all the, the, the gimbals and cameras and whatnot. But the fact that reading your article, Haya, you can see 17 miles away with this little drone, yeah. that's pretty powerful. And I bet a lot of people are asking, you know, is this drone a phantom killer? What if this drone was available to the commercial market, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this could be a drone that could be really viable in a commercial market, especially for inspections, especially for having a non, you know, uh, certain manufactured country made. And frankly, I, the fact that it offers a triple payload on this small yeah. airframe is actually kind of exciting because I think the Anafi is a little too light. I think it could do well from some weight. And I would love to see some more features from an Anafi. But if you added some simple things yeah. like, you know, again, an attitude mode to avoid flyaway, a better VTX, this could be the drone that could really prop up the American drone market and provide significant competition to the existing manufacturers out there. But once again, in order to be truly competitive with these other drones, you have to offer some of the similar features, but understand why they are important. And for attitude mode, well, if you're a significant pilot or a professional pilot, you know exactly why you need an attitude mode. But uh, anyway, Haya, that brings us to this next piece of news, which it looks like you found a use of this drone in Italy doing the very thing that we are deathly afraid of here in America. What's happening? Yeah, so in Italy, in a resort town, Rimini, uh, the police has used drones as well to, uh, to see if people are uh, living up to the social distancing rules and the stay-at-home orders. And of course, with summer kicking in and it's beautiful weather, people are anxious to get outside. I think a lot of them suffer from uh, cabin fever in Italy as well, especially considering that these orders have been in place for so long. So this story is about uh, a guy who figured, you know what, the beach is deserted. I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to go outside, enjoy the sun and sunbathe a little bit. Which I think it, many people would argue is probably pretty harmless. Uh, the police did view it a little differently. They were scoping out the beach with the uh, parrot and half. He found him and then sent out two uh, guys on quads, uh, ATV vehicles, drove down the beach to this person. He was totally surprised. And then the police decided to use this footage and share it on social media. And I think this is kind of where it backfired on them because then people are like, well, you know what? There are bigger fish to fry than just to go after one guy who's sunbathing on a totally deserted beach, even though he doesn't follow the uh, the stay at home order and uh, and rules. So a lot of people were likening the police to dictators and uh, they did not agree at all with this particular use of drones to hunt down people who are uh, sunbathing. So. 
I think they have a good point there. I mean, of course, we all know that in order to uh, stop the disease from spreading so quickly, social distancing and stay-at-home orders seem to be very effective. Uh, just to kind of illustrate here, the uh, the numbers in Italy, as we all know, are pretty bad. I mean, this is last weekend that this video was shot. Uh, during that same weekend, they had 17,500 people that were reported for failing to comply with the uh, social distancing rules. They had close to 9,000 people that were sanctioned for illegitimate travel, 74 people for false declarations because you need a note that says, hey, I'm allowed to be outside and travel to wherever. And nine of them were fined for violating social distancing rules. So things are pretty serious in Italy. They have discovered drones as well. They've used them. And yeah, they get some backlash from the public. Because not everybody's happy with these kind of drone applications. Is this not the perfect example? Is this not the perfect example of perception from the public? I hope there are. I hope every public safety agency in the country is watching this right now. Because this is the example that we're trying to warn you uh, about. And yeah. we have your best interest at heart. Trust me. We want what you want, which is good intentions. But I think uh, running businesses, we are much more acutely aware of even though you may have good intentions, it doesn't matter. What matters is perception. And I think, Haya, one of the greatest lessons that I ever learned from one of my first managers, uh, Becky Green. God, I love that lady. Amazing human being. She said, Paul, because I was always trying to do the right thing, but in a kind of in a way that people didn't understand because I look down on dumb people and it's pedantic and it's not good. But she said, Paul, perception is reality. Yeah. And that's it right there. Well, remember the story we had last week of the uh, the police uh, in New Jersey that were using drones for those drive by birthday celebrations? Yes. That's perception right there. And people love that when they use drones versus this case in Italy where people get pissed off because of the use of drones. I think you're going to see something come out of drone you very soon that's going to take that story a little further. Uh, a, uh, a drone drive-by training? <laughs> hey, I mean, I'm not going to give away the farm, but just ah, wait, on. Haya. This is actually the one thing that I forgot to bring up in our meeting earlier. <laughs> so anyway, uh, actually, Rob's son had a birthday yesterday. And I wanted to go do that for him. But unfortunately, I had traveled to the local brewery to pick up my weekly supply of Pilsner and wasn't able to drive and then fly to his house. (laughs) So (laughs) I didn't do it. Next year. Next year. (laughs) Yeah, next year for sure. But, you know, you just mentioned something important, right? All of these efforts to reduce the spread of the virus, the, the social distancing, the lack of travel. And many people have said that in order for us to unlock things, what we need to do is have a better understanding of where this virus is still hiding out, right? 10 days asymptomatic transportation. So it makes you wonder if the American government were to utilize people like Zipline that we may actually be able to get tests to millions more Americans in a very short period of time. And it begs the question, Mr. President, why not hire all the drone pilots in the United States and get this, get this plan going? Let's utilize our people. There are very intelligent, good hearted human beings who can really help stop this spread. And Zipline is showing us that in Ghana, if you're open to learning, well, you can get tests out a lot faster. Flying Dutchman, fly us to Africa. What's happening? (laughs) I I love the Zipline story. I mean, they've been around for a couple of years. It's a California-based company. They operate in Africa. And you may wonder why. Why don't they operate here in the United States? Well, in Africa, the rules are a lot less strict. So they can they can fly drones and use drones for delivery purposes in ways that they wouldn't be able to do here in the U.S. purely because of uh, regulations. They started in Rwanda. They've done, I think it's over 34,000 successful drone deliveries where they they ship and shuttle back and forth uh, blood samples, medications, uh, smaller supplies that fit in the body of a uh, unmanned aircraft. And now they've moved to Ghana. And basically, they're doing the same thing, but it's more specifically to fight and to help stop the spreading coronavirus. They've used four drones with 51 samples that were delivered over distances of 35 miles. 
And they fly those distances really, really quickly. We these are fixed wing drones, so we're not talking about quadcopters that uh, don't fly as fast. And when they get to their destination with the zipline drone, they basically open up the belly of the uh, unmanned aircraft and out drops the package with a little parachute and it pretty much lands in the backyard or wherever it needs to uh, deliver. It's a super effective way. I know in Rwanda, I believe they have two uh, launch locations where they send these drones out from and they cover at least 80 or 85 percent of the entire country. So anywhere where you have uh, roads that are in poor conditions, which in Rwanda is uh, the case quite often, but also think of areas like um, the Seattle area where you have a lot of islands and where uh, if you travel by car or by truck, you need to take ferries to go to your destination. Drones don't have those problems. They just fly and they get there much, much faster. So in the United States, it would not legally speaking, but um, technically speaking, it would be totally be feasible to use drones to help get out uh, N95 masks, to get vaccines or uh, test samples out and back to, to labs as well. So there would be so many use cases for drones. However, we can't really pursue them because of the legal restrictions that are currently in place. Now, we know that uh, Zipline is in talks with the FEA to see if they can fast track their program. Uh, Zipline themselves said technically they, they would be able to use their medical drones in the United States and they would be able to pretty much cover the entire country, be a crazy fast rollout of their platform. But technically speaking, there really is no restriction. So, yeah, I think there is a huge opportunity here to show how drones can be used. I mean, the urgency is there. The need is there. We have the technology available there. They've been showcasing it in those two African countries for a number of years with thousands of successful flights. I would say let's see if we can make this happen here in the United States as well. It uh, makes, me, makes me want to write an article, Haya, about how we could create the Airbnb of drone delivery. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah opportunity right there as well uh i think that's the next article i'm gonna be writing and sending over to you so <laughs> <laughs> anyway no, way. we'll talk about it in next week's show <laughs> i look forward to it as always and that yeah. brings us to our next piece of news which for me is by far the most exciting why my tinkerer mind is on fire you ever seen a drone flip upside down and not go into the flip of death well, one company out of Zurich is showing us that everything that we thought that we knew about drones, well, is limited. Haya, what's going on? Yeah, we really, uh, we, we should edit the video into our show so people can actually see it uh, as well. ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, engineers from university have created a drone six arms but every arm of the drone has two sets of propellers and they rotate so not just the spinning propeller itself but the entire end of the arm rotates meaning that this drone can move in any dimension three dimensions but in any which way with the use of these propellers which is it's crazy because there's no flip of death like it doesn't matter if the drone is sideways or upside down uh, doesn't matter one bit Again, go watch that video because it, it might be hard to imagine how this drone flies, but if you see the video, it makes total sense. It's a pretty substantially sized drone, so for more practical purposes, I think it'd be nice if they can probably shrink that down a little bit. But you can imagine that, um, let's say, fire departments, if they had a building that was on fire and the fire's been put out and you need a drone to get inside that building and move around and kind of show the lay of the land, uh, a drone that can fly in any direction will be tremendously useful. So I think there's a huge opportunity for a drone that's, that has this kind of capability. Of course, this is a prototype. It's a pretty large drone. It's probably very expensive to make. But if you think a few here, uh, years ahead into the future and you get this drone down to a smaller size and more refined and less expensive, then, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for drones that can fly uh, in any which way like this one does. I, I can't even imagine the possibilities of having a drone like this. I think it's really cool. It's kind of taking like the Elios ideology a little, a few steps further. So I think that that's really cool. You just imagine the places that this thing could explore. And honestly, I can't wait to see uh, more of what they do. But it seems like some of the best drones in the world right now are coming out of this particular area of the world. I mean, think of Wingtra. You know, for those of you who haven't seen Wingtra, and in fact, that reminds me, I need to upload the Wingtra video uh, so that way Kirill can put it in this show and you guys can see it. It is the most sophisticated fixed wing aircraft I have ever seen. Yep. Um, and it's reliable. It's like Toyota. It's yep. like Toyota met NASA. 
So, um, it, I mean, it's really awesome. But anyway, Haya, this brings us to uh, another piece of news. I mean, you know, as drone manufacturers are trying to pump out new stuff in the wake of what's going on, you know, this brings us back to, uh, I have to say, at CES, because after hearing yeah. reports that the coronavirus outbreak started way earlier than we thought, it makes me grateful that you and I escaped CES uh, blissfully. So that being said, though, it looks like not everyone is escaping the wake of the virus just yet, or maybe they are. What's going on with Autel here, Haya? Yeah, Autel Robotics. I mean, we had a chance to, uh, to meet with them and sit down with them at CES. They had at least 20 of the drones, I think, with them, uh, all three different models. For the people who don't remember, you have the 8K version, which shoots 8K video, hence the name. Uh, there's going to be a 6K version with a one inch sensor, which is probably really the one to get for any professional or serious photographer, videographer. And then there will be a dual version that combines the 8K video one uh, with a thermal camera, which I believe has twice the resolution of the DJI Method 2 Enterprise dual. So that's another drone that would be, uh, of course, uh, very interesting for people in search and rescue. The thing with Hotel Robotics was that they were scrambling to, to get to CES and to get the booth there in time and to have the inventory with them to showcase this new drone. Since then, like any other company, uh, they've been hit and hurt by the coronavirus as well. And they had to delay uh, the delivery of their 8K version. That's the one that comes to the U.S. market first uh, by a number of weeks. Now, this week, we're happy to report that people have been uh, taking delivery of these drones. Uh, on social media, I've seen different dealers and retailers who have them uh, in stock. So the 8K version is available now. Uh, originally, when we spoke to Hotel Robotics, they said that the 6K version, the one that I'm really interested in, actually, would be uh, about four to six weeks behind the 8K version. So that means that hopefully by the end of May, maybe early June, if things go well, uh, we would have uh, the 6K version available in the US as well. And then, of course, the dual one would then be another month or so after that. The Evo 2 from Hotel with the dual camera setup is quite a bit more expensive because I think the thermal camera itself or the sensor itself is like four and a half thousand bucks. So if you take that and throw on top the, let's say, two thousand dollars you need for the Hotel Evo, uh, that will be a pretty expensive drone. However, if you save one life with a drone like that, I think you've already uh, recouped the money easily. So great news, Hotel is available. We need the competition. We need uh, more drones and more alternatives than just the DJI drones. I know Skydio, they have an amazing drone. I think they stopped their production. I haven't heard that it came back online yet. And a lot of people are waiting to get their hands on that drone as well. I hope they get back to the market quickly because like I said, it would be good to have some more options available to us. Yeah, uh, definitely. It's making me think about the viability of that thermal Autel Evo 2 versus the Parrot and Alfie thermal. And it really, really, really makes me think, you know, there's a couple really cool benefits to that Autel drone. You know, the no geofencing, um, yep. the screen in the remote. But once again, put an attitude mode on the damn thing. Um, I have to say, Haya, though, I agree with you 100%. Competition is good. Yet it seems like layoffs across the industry are really affecting the propensity of these uh, competitors to truly take flight, pun intended. Uh, so it makes me wonder when people like Jeff, who, you know, Jeff, you and I were talking to, he was like North American head of Autel, right? Because Autel is based out of China. You know, now that he's gone, it really makes me wonder uh, what what's coming down the line because he was a really phenomenal uh, guy. He, he, he was great at building relationships, and it's sad to see him go. But, um, you know, it really makes me wonder what's, uh, what's, what's the future hold for the drone industry, Haya? Yeah, it's, it's tough because we've heard of layoffs and firings at, uh, at different companies, uh, not just Hotel, also uh, DJI. And I think when you lose people uh, because of a crisis like this, you, you don't just lose the value that they bring to the company, but the, you also lose all their experience, all their knowledge, their entire personal network that they may have within an industry. Uh, you lose some of the credibility that those people brought uh, for your organization as well. So laying off people in order to survive a crisis, I get it. But at the same time, you, you do lose quite a bit when you're talking about experienced people that have been in the business for so long. So it's a loss for sure. And um, 
Going back to the Autel Evo real quick, uh, this drone is much more robust than the Parrot and Avi, I would say. Also, it has the omnidirectional obstacle avoidance sensors, higher resolution for the thermal camera. So for search and rescue, I think this drone will be uh, super interesting and super useful for sure. Yeah, I wish the Parrot and Afis, though, would just beef up their vehicles a little bit. They feel so flimsy, and when they fly, it doesn't give you the sense of confidence of flying that thing. Yeah, I've flown that. It didn't even make it through the obstacle course. Uh, on good tried it. Epic failure. I'll show you real quick the one that uh, they sent me first. This one had a uh, mid-air collision with a DJI Mavic Air. And this one crashed. Uh, the legs broke and came apart because you see how this twists and torques, uh, it's, it's, it's too flimsy for prolonged and frequent use, I would say. When they had the mid-air collision, the DJI Mavic Air just kind of shook it off and just stayed in the air, whereas the Anafi tumbled right to the ground immediately. So I think they need to beef up these drones a little bit for sure. Yeah, definitely. But uh, again, competition is a great thing. Great thing. The only people who benefit from that is the drone industry as a whole. So you know, everyone, I think it's important uh, to realize that. Also, I think it's important to realize that, you know, this entire uh, kick for remote ID and all these new rules, Haya, it seemed like the virus may not have affected all of these hirings and firings at these companies. Rather, it seems like remote ID may have been kicking in and scaring away the public to buy drones way before the virus, which I know you have something coming out here soon that we'll talk about on the show coming up, but I, I just have to say I'm ready for your 60 minutes special on this because it's really interesting seeing the data that you have aggregated and seeing what's going on in this industry. It seems like uh, just reading the initial preliminary information that it seems like the remote ID might have scared everyone away from flying drones and might have had an enormous impact on the industry. And the coronavirus may have actually saved the industry. So um, at least that's a, that last part is my speculative piece, okay? So um, that being said, though, hi, I can't wait till you get this article out because I think people need to realize the impact Remote ID had on people, and I think they need to realize how that's going to impact our industry. And then I, th uh, I think people need... I think people need to see this, Haya. Yeah, I mean, for, for sure, the, uh, the increase in regulations for drones uh, and remote ID being the most important one and the restrictions that come with remote ID, if it were to be implemented the way it's been written, that scares people away. Of course, the coronavirus makes the drones from your wish list or shopping list probably sink to somewhere near the bottom because there's all these other things that are more urgent and more important right now than buying a new toy for yourself or your kids or whoever. So there's a lot of pressure on drone sales. And what we've heard, I mean, nobody reports official numbers. Uh, there aren't really any larger drone manufacturers who are publicly traded. So we don't have any quarterly reports or annual reports to look into. Uh, but just based on conversations with people in the industry, he says drone sales overall have tanked, basically. Um, I know for the consumer market, that was a trend that already had started. I mean, if you look, just look at uh, the traffic in Google searches when it comes to drone keywords, you can see that that has dropped off as well. But more um, importantly, in the, in the last six months or so, drone sales have hurt uh, tremendously. So hopefully that's going to pick back up at some point. I mean, we know we have some, some cool new products coming our way. Hopefully that's going to help. And hopefully this virus uh, gets out of our way so that people can go outside again. Economy picks back up and people start enjoying uh, their life and their drones, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely very interesting. Um, we ran a poll on Instagram, Haya, last weekend, so posted a lot of stories. And if you're not following us on Instagram, follow us on Instagram for a daily reminder of a part 107 question. But hi, I, I put a poll out there, right? I posted your article. I even tagged you and linked you. I hope you saw that. I saw it and I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, the results of the poll on that post about, hey, you know, who would consider buying the Mavic Air 2, it was 74% said no. 
Did they say why or just no? I wish they would have said why, uh, but no, I, I, I should probably put out another story then asking people why. So, <laughs> um, But I think it's probably a cash flow issue for most people if I were to guess. I mean, even myself included, right? You want to be really careful with cash because you really don't know how long this is going to go. So the very last thing that you're doing is spending money on things that don't make you money. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the the last real big seller, I think, for DJI has been the DJI Mavic 2 Pro and Zoom. I mean, I know for a fact that that thing sold like crazy. People were somewhat disappointed with the drone because I think they were expecting more, especially in terms of uh, 4K video quality. It seemed to uh, underperform the Phantom drone. So I think right now a lot of people are waiting for a DJI Mavic 3 to come out that's going to blow anything else out of the water. And I think the product that DJI is about to release kind of fits somewhere in the middle and that may be great but it might not tick the boxes for the more serious and more professional drone pilots out there i think uh, their their focus is much more geared towards the uh, dji mavic 3 uh, which hopefully will still come out this summer i have to say drones have been my zen zone man without flying i'd be so stressed out so i know uh, cash is low for some people Maybe they'll spend their stimulus money on it. I know that unemployment is paying all-time highs right now, so maybe they will buy it. And uh, it also could be too little too late here, Haya. But frankly, I will say at Drone U, while I would love to get one on my hands, I'm pretty sure DJI and maybe Maria are still not happy with me about the Mavic Mini. So I doubt we'll get one. And if that's the case, it's probably for the best because I don't have to waste any time talking about it. So because, again, here at DroneU, we're focused on giving, you know, practical information, right? Things that we learn in the field to help people. That's our motivation and inspiration and drive is, you know, we love helping other people. And if we're not honest with other people, then we're not helping them. So, you know, that's why I think it's so important, you know, to really discuss these issues. And, and you know, you don't have to really come to a solution or a conclusion, but rather... Just like you said earlier, and I want to end on this, we have to be willing to have these hard conversations and ask these questions, and we need to come up with solutions and not just complain. I couldn't have said it better. I totally agree with you there, buddy. Well, Haya, thanks again for joining us on another epic news show. Frankly, my friend, I love doing these with you, and I hope everyone enjoyed it today. But uh, Haya, stay safe out there. Good seeing you as always, and can't wait to see you next week to drop some bombshells, some real bombshells. Well, uh, we'll do our best. Well, I'm looking forward to next week's show as well. And uh, thanks for your time today. And we're on to the next one. Sounds good, Hi. Well, you take care. And for everyone else out there, thank you again for joining us as always. Thank you for the increased reviews. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe and leave us a like. If you're listening to us, please, well, leave us a review. It really helps us out. Hi, I thank you again for joining me. And thank you all for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. We do love helping you. If you want more help, more information, check out the regular podcast, Ask Drone You, or become a member today and find out why thousands of other people are joining Drone You at record rates. Haya, thanks again. That's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. This is Ask Drone You. News edition.